Thank you. It's a pleasure. Please, you're welcome to give your talk. We're looking forward to hearing it. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with all of you, even if only virtually. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to actually share my screen so that uh, we can get on with the lecture. So... Okay, you can see this? Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about development in the time of climate crisis. And I think all of us know that there is a climate crisis, but I want to remind you of an IPCC report of two years ago. Now, the reason I'm giving what might seem like an outdated report is because uh, several people from the IPCC have actually informally told me that the subsequent reports have been edited down because of the worry that they would be too stark and the reality would be too dire for most people to absorb. So this is the last report two years ago when they actually were reasonably honest in terms of the seriousness of the crisis that we already face. And some of the things that they said are still very important. First of all, we already know that it's already upon us. It's causing substantial damage and losses in all of our ecosystems, terrestrial, freshwater, coastal, marine, all of them. What is more worrying is that the extent and the magnitude of the changes is significantly more than in the previous reports. And that in fact, each report progressively has underestimated the extent of the changes that are already occurring in our ecosystems because of the planetary changes. So for example, there's a lot of deterioration of both the structure and function of our ecosystems. And there is also a deter deter deterioration in the resilience and natural adaptive capacity around us. There are major changes in seasonal timing, which affect agriculture, which affect a whole range of other activities. Some losses are already irreversible. For example, there are already a number of species that are now extinct because of climate change. There are other impacts that are close to irreversible like hydrological changes because of the retreat of glaciers and the change in some mountainous and Arctic ecosystems because of permafrost thaw. In fact, two scientists actually told a high level board of the UN of which I was associated, the Board on Effective Multilateralism, that the melting down of the Arctic and Antarctic systems is something that is beyond what their models had predicted. And the implications cannot be fully incorporated into their models. In other words, they simply don't know. The changes are so extreme and so rapid that in a way, all bets are off. They are unable to predict what the implications are. We already know that there are significant social and economic consequences. There are huge impacts, of course, on physical health, but also on mental health. And these are dominantly in the low and middle income countries. So we have humanitarian crises occurring wherever these climate hazards are interacting with high vulnerability that already exists. One of the other important points that this sixth assessment report made is that there are huge adaptation gaps across countries, regions, areas, and, and categories of people, especially by income and assets. And we know this already. We know that the low and middle income countries are much less able to adapt to these changes. We also know that groups of people within countries have much greater inability to adapt. But also the, this particular report pointed to the increased evidence of maladaptation. And this is adaptation which the IPCC calls tendencies to respond which make the problem worse. For example, there's fire suppression in naturally fire adapted ecosystems. Some seawalls and hard defenses against flooding actually shift the problem to other geographical regions and areas. The tendency to adopt more air conditioning in warmer climates adds to the problem as well because of the types of air conditioning that are used and so on. This evidence of maladaptation is something that has not been sufficiently talked about in subsequent reports, again, apparently for political pressure. 
Now, I'm arguing that there is major global climate, in, climate inequality, that in effect, climate change itself is a result of inequality, and the way it uh, turns out is, again, something that adds to global inequality, and how we try to deal with it, again, adds to global inequality. How is this expressed? Well, first, first of all, the core countries, the advanced economies, and the elites globally. So it's a combination of both, not just the rich countries in the world, but rich people across all regions are able to consume and produce basically on, on an imperialist basis. And what do I mean by imperialist? I mean, here I'm looking at imperialism not in terms of political control like colonialism and so on. I'm talking about imperialism as a struggle of large capital over economic territory when it is supported by nation states. Now, this mode of living it generates increasing global carbon emissions and a very large ecological footprint. Um, and it is obvious much more in advanced economies. And this is evident uh, much more than uh, in terms of the ability to deal with natural disasters and geophysical changes, but also the fact that these continue to add to natural disasters. The problem is that the international negotiations address climate change in unequal, deceptive, and often debilitating ways. And I'm going to explain how. I'm also going to argue that the operations of global finance and the fiscal strategies of major advanced economies increase carbon emissions. At the same time, they do not make available the required finance for effective mitigation and adaptation strategies in the rest of the world. The system of privatized knowledge monopolies expressed in intellectual property rights prevent most of humanity from being able to access the basic technologies that we need to confront this climate challenge. And meanwhile, the fact that there is uh, a new technology, there are new technologies available for greening, for both mitigation and adaptation, but these are increasingly giving rise to natural resource grabs aimed at certain strategic minerals. Lithium is a classic example, along with new forms of extractivist competition among the leading powers. So one of the basic problems is that climate change is a uh, global problem. I mean, that's kind of obvious, right? The climate and the planet, they don't recognize national borders and passports and visas and so on. However, the way we are dealing with it globally is still based on national responsibilities and national commitments. How does it work? Well, uh, you all know about the Conference of Parties meetings. Countries are assigned climate responsibility based on national uh, carbon emissions, the current national carbon emissions. And then these form the basis of climate negotiations and national commitments to control emissions. For example, at the COP26 in Glasgow, COP27, COP28. But what this does is it ignores the historic responsibility, the carbon debt. And so it understates the responsibility of richer countries. Because the reason we have this problem today is because of a history of carbon emissions that have created a stock and created a tendency towards global warming. In addition, when you're looking at carbon responsibility, the COPs typically reply, uh, rely on the PPP measures of GDP, that is GDP measured not in actual market exchange rates, but on purchasing power parity measures of exchange rates, which are a construct. They are not what is actually experienced by anyone in the global economy. They are a construct which is based based on a rather flimsy and an analytically problematic uh, understanding. But one of the major problems is that these overstate the incomes of poorer countries. So poorer countries are assigned greater responsibility than they are able to bear based on the market exchange rates. Another problem is that the measures of carbon emissions are production-based rather than consumption-based, and that underplays the continued significance of consumption in the North. I will explain how this works in a minute. And then, as a result of that, uh, recent in increases in carbon emissions are used to blame certain countries, especially China and India, which are seen as very large global emitters today. But because per capita indicators are not used, it's easy to then say, well, you know, China has to change immediately or India has to change. 
So let's look at the historical debt. So this is one particular estimate. There are several estimates, but this one particular estimate, uh, which is dating from the mid 19th century, suggests that today's developed countries, which account for 14% of global population, are responsible for nearly 80% of the cumulative carbon emissions over this entire period. As you can see, the United States, European Union, Japan, and so on. Now, you could say, well, wait a minute, and nobody knew about carbon in the 19th century. Nobody knew that it was a problem for at least one of this one century of this period. So how can we blame our ancestors for things which were not seen as a problem? That is true. But it turns out that more than half of these carbon emissions occurred in the last 30 years. And in those last 30 years, everybody knew. By the 1980s, it was absolutely well known uh, that global warming is a problem and that carbon emissions are the main uh, determinant of that global warming. So it, in fact, much more could have been done in terms of climate mitigation, but about half or actually slightly more than half of these historical emissions occurred in the period when it was well known that this is a concern and a problem. So let's now consider these methods of determining carbon emissions. Um, the, excuse me, I'm just trying to make this less, yeah. Um, there are different ways about doing, uh, for doing this. One is the production-based emissions. And here, the responsibility is fully placed on the producers of goods and services within any lo locality, the area, the nation, or the region. So this is really whatever carbon is emitted in the process of production at whatever value point of the value chain, uh, point of the value chain for any product or service. This is actually what is used by the UNFCCC. This is what is used in the COPS. How much carbon is currently emitted for all production occurring within the nation? Now, obviously this doesn't consider the impact of cross-border trade, and I will look at that in a minute. <coughs> Excuse me. Another way of doing this is to look only in terms of extraction, because it is recognized that extracted natural resources, especially fossil fuels, are the dominant cause of carbon emissions. So you look at the life cycle of those fossil fuels. You look at the responsibility in terms of who is ex extracting the resource by considering the downstream emissions enabled by the sale of that resource or fuel. Another way is to look at it in terms of the value added emissions. You allocate the emissions according to who benefits, who gets the value added over the life cycle of that product in each step of the value chain. This is a more complicated and statistically more demanding way of trying to measure emissions. The one that to me makes the most sense, the consumption based emissions. Uh, are those that result from satisfying domestic demand that is both consumption and investment. And so you're looking at the responsibility of life cycle emissions allocated to the final consumers of goods and services. You're saying, well, look, it's not just how much you produce within your own borders, but what your consumption requires in terms of those carbon emissions, consumption in terms of both what you consume, final consumption, but also what you invest. And we will see that the numbers vary dramatically depending on which measure you use. So the UNFCCC, as I have measured, as I've indicated, uh, uses the production-based emissions. And here are the largest emissions uh, emitters in the world. About 85% of global emissions comes from these countries alone. And this is the total emissions uh, based. And uh, the two periods are the blue bars refer to 2000 and the, the orange bars refer to 2019. That is before the pandemic. And as you know, the pandemic sort of reduced emissions for a while before they have come up dramatically after that. Okay, now according to this, as you can see, China, which was earlier the second largest emitter, became the largest emitter. And by a significant margin, it has dramatically increased its emissions over this two decade period. The United States, which was the largest emitter, then it has become the second largest emitter. And in fact, its emissions have come down over this period. Okay, so it seems to be improving. India dramatically increases also. It becomes the third largest emitter. And then you have, you know, uh, Russia, which is an oil exporter, Iran, etc. Some countries like Japan, Germany, Korea, 
are largely there because of the fact that it's both production and consumption emissions that have been significant. But it's really this which is used to highlight the important and significant role of China and India. And the argument that, you know, until you stop, reduce those emissions, nothing will actually happen in terms of the global emissions. However, if you look at per capita production emissions, then you get quite a different story, okay? Then it turns out Saudi Arabia is the largest per capita emitter. The United States and Australia, the second largest. The United States uh, is also, if you remember, also an oil producer as well as a very large oil consumer. Australia, mainly a mineral exporter. And then other major mineral exporters, Russia, Canada, et cetera, Iran, uh, become significant. China is much less significant. China then has less than half of the emissions of the United States, for example. And India becomes a relatively small emitter, only two metric tons per capita. So the per capita emissions suggest a very different story. But we know that production is not really the adequate part of expressing this. We know that international trade plays a big role in driving emissions and that the rich countries, especially after the turn of the century, uh, significantly outsourced their carbon emissions, if you like. That is to say, they started importing more carbon intensive uh, goods, the goods and services that were produced with more carbon, they started uh, relocating the production and importing a lot of that. So uh, the this is in 2015, the orange bars are the consumption emissions, the blue bars are the production emissions, and the gray bars give us the balance. So if the balance is negative, it means that that country is importing more carbon intensive stuff, if the balance, the gray bars are positive, it means that this is the country exporting more carbon intensive stuff. And unsurprisingly, you find that South Africa, India, Russia, China are the big exporters of carbon intensive goods and China dominates in that. The United States dominates in importing the carbon intensive goods, but other rich countries are also playing a significant role. Japan, UK, France, Germany, Italy, et cetera. Okay, so within this group of the large emitters, there is a significant difference in terms of how much you're doing this for export production and how much you're really emitting in terms of the uh, net imports. So now if we look at per capita e emissions by final demand, we get the real difference. And here the US is way ahead of everyone else, as you can see. The US per capita, in emissions in terms of final demand is a whopping 18 metric tons per capita. Um, and it's followed by the rich industrial countries like Japan, Germany, uh, the UK, Italy, France. Russia is also a large per capita emitter. But India, for example, is only 1.5 metric tons per capita. It's tiny, okay? Uh, way below the global average of four metric tons. And China, again, just slightly above the global average at 5.7, by no means, therefore, a large emitter in per capita consumption terms. Now let's look at what's going to happen because of all this climate change. This is one estimate. It's uh, by a UN organization, which is trying to assess the change in GDP per, uh, that could be happening over this century because of climate change. And what's very interesting is that the big changes are happening in the countries that have contributed the least in terms of the per capita emissions or the historical emissions. That is, it's dominantly in Africa, South Asia, parts of Central and Latin America, Southeast Asia. So the regions that are affected the worst in terms of the projected impact on economic activity are the ones that have contributed the least. By contrast, some of the regions that have contributed the most, Russia, Canada, and so on, are actually gainers in terms of benefiting from the climate changes. And other regions like the United States, uh, China, and so on, Europe, they are some parts of Europe are benefiting and other parts are barely affected, very little affected in terms of GDP. So you see that there is a sort of inbuilt 
injustice in terms of the impacts that are going to be felt over the course of this century. <clears throat> Once again, if you let's look at this, this is a UNICEF estimate in terms of the impacts of health risks and child mortality. And again, you can see that it's Africa, especially Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and Central America that are the worst affected in terms of the children's uh, health and mortality impacts because of the climate change. Whereas the countries that are dominantly causing this uh, have relatively low or low to medium impacts in terms of the health of the children. Here is a measure from the World uh, Climate Inequality Report, which came out in 2023. And this is, I think, very telling. Now, this is not in terms of countries. This is in terms of the wealth uh, and other inequalities globally. And so this is a very brave attempt to measure global inequality, both in terms of the wealth inequality, the emissions inequality, and the potential losses. And what is really stark is what's happening to the bottom 50% of the global population, okay? The relative losses of that bottom 50% are significant. They account for 75% of the losses, okay? The uh, emissions, on the other hand, they have contributed only 12% of the emissions. And this relates to current emissions, not historical. So the current emissions, they contribute only 12%, but they're going to face 75% of the losses. Their, their wealth ownership is only 2% of the global wealth ownership. So really, they have no capacity to finance anything, whether it's mitigation or adaptation. Let's look by contrast at the top 10% globally. And the top 10% globally, their relative losses are tiny, marginal. They don't really face them. 3% is negligible, okay? On the other hand, they're responsible for around half of emissions. 48% of emissions currently come from the top 10%. Uh, and their capacity to finance is huge. It's more than three fourths. It's 76% of the total capacity. So you can see already the, the fundamental inequalities that are built in, if you just look at these two. The middle 40%, it's no surprise. They have relative losses of about 22% and capacity to finance is similar. Their emissions account for about 40% of the total currently. What's very significant also, and this is taken also from uh, data from the World Inequality Lab of Paris, is that emissions inequality within countries is significant. Now, this is uh, looking at the regions, but uh, they also have data for the countries. But this is, I think, an extremely important uh, set of information because it's telling us that the bottom 50% in every single region don't contribute that much other than in North America. North America, the bottom 50% still has significant emissions. However, the top 10% in every region other than Sub-Saharan Africa, the top 10% in every region other than Sub-Saharan Africa have very high emissions, more than the bottom half of North America even, and significantly more than the bottom half of Europe. So it's the rich in every region that are responsible. I, other than sub-Saharan Africa. And in, in some cases that the rich in that region, let's say in East Asia, are many multiples of the bottom half in their own region, of course, but even in uh, 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 for the bottom half of the rich regions of North America and Europe. In fact, unsurprisingly, the North American top 10% have emission rates, per capita emission rates, these are metric tons, right, uh, off the charts. Uh, and of course, if you look at the top 1%, then it's absolutely crazy. Uh, but in every region, as I said, the rich, the rich 10%, the top 10% have been significantly responsible. What is even more telling is that over the past 15, 20 years, the emissions of the top 10% and of the top 1% have been growing in every region whereas the emissions of the bottom 50% have been either stagnant or declining. So the poor are not emitting more. In many cases, they are emitting less. Whereas the top 10%, their emissions have been growing dramatically, and the top 1%, the emissions have been growing exponentially. 
So this tells us that it's really, we have to address inequality within regions, of course, between regions, but mainly within regions. We have to address this inequality because it's the rich who are causing this problem. So what this means, for example, is that you can do po poverty eradication uh, with climate change mitigation. It's not that, you know, eliminating poverty requires significantly more emissions or anything. So um, first of all, around two thirds of carbon emissions are due to within country inequality. And this is across most regions. But very tellingly, you could lift the entire world's population, the current one third, above the PPP poverty line of $3.2 per day. And you would increase global carbon emissions by only 5%. In other words, it could really be done with a negligible increase in global carbon emissions. If you would simultaneously reduce the carbon emissions of the top 5%, of the top 10%, then you would have no increase in global carbon emissions. And as I have already mentioned, the current carbon emissions of the top 10% of the world's population are about half of the total. The top 1%, it's around 15% of the total. And mind you, this is, as I said, it's increased. The share of the carbon emissions of the top 1% has gone up from around 10% to 15%. So it's the super rich globally who are really causing this problem. This can be funded, as we've shown, with the, you know, with the kind of wealth that is there. So the carbon inequality report estimates that if you tax the centimillionaires, that is those who have assets of more than 100 million, and a very minor wealth tax, only 1.5% wealth tax, would provide $290 billion per year on the current estimate of wealth. So that is on 2022 wealth. Of course, since then, the wealth has gone up even further. And this compares to adaptation needs of the low and middle income countries, which are currently estimated at around 200 billion per year. Okay, So you would get much more than that with just this relatively small wealth tax, which let's face it, centimillionaires would not even notice because 1.5% is well within the margin of the valuation fluctuations of their wealth, let's say stock market changes and so on, that occur every year anyway. What this also means is that it's wrong to pose this problem as one of, you know, either we can do development and poverty reduction or we can do climate mitigation. And this is often something that is uh, mentioned in many developing countries, in my own country, India, for example, it's often argued that, no, no, we can't do climate mitigation right now because we have to develop and we have to give our people the basic needs and so on. It is possible to develop. We can, for example, uh, improve the level of energy efficiency of the economy. We can change patterns of investment and consumption towards activities that require less energy. We can uh, change the energy uh, composition. Uh, we can move from the most carbon emitting resources like coal and petroleum to natural gas and then to clean renewables like solar and wind and possibly hydro. So it's possible to do this while actually adding to development. In other words, what we have to do is change the pattern of development. This also means changing urbanization patterns to make for more ecologically sound urbanization patterns, which is not what we have been doing so far. Now, in fact, this is actually better for developing countries. This is uh, then continuing with the current patterns because the current patterns, as I have shown, are disastrous from the point of view of the impact of climate change. Now, obviously this requires more investment, but there is a, um, an estimate by Noam Chomsky and Robert Polin from my university which suggests that you know the only a uh, relatively small part of uh, the GDP of large economies between 1.5 to 2.5 percent of the GDP of large economies uh, would actually suffice to generate this required investment. But obviously, it's not just finance. We also need access to the newest technologies, and currently, that is constrained by the intellectual property regime. So that's another major constraint that has to be removed. Now, we've talked about how climate finance is required, but you know, relatively small amounts for adaptation, 200 billion, relatively small amounts for mitigation, uh, 
But what have we got actually? Well, hardly anything. Remember that there were the rich countries in 2012, they promised 100 billion per year. They did not deliver this at all. Less than 67 billion per year was uh, provided provided relative to what was promised. And most of this was actually from multilateral sources, from the development banks and multilateral climate funds. Very little bilateral. The bilateral was only, uh, you know, about uh, 26%, which was really nothing uh, uh, relative to what they had promised. However, even that is meaningless because it's true that the official estimates are low, but they're overestimates because all kinds of crazy things are inserted into climate finance. You may not believe this, but you know the promise was made in 2012. And uh, 12 years later, we still don't have a globally accepted definition of climate finance. So anything goes. There was an attempt made at the latest COP in Dubai, but even that didn't succeed. So we do not have a definition. And so countries can put anything down as climate finance. There was a Reuters investigation that was very revealing in terms of what is being provided as climate finance. So for example, Italy provided a subsidy for retailers to open chocolate and gelato stores across Asia. Now, how that is climate finance, I don't know. Is it adaptation that you can have gelato and so you don't feel the heat? The US actually does a coastal hotel expansion in Haiti. And that is climate finance, probably because they said, well, maybe they're installing special, you know, seawater walls or something. Belgium subsidizes a film of a love story. And because it's set in an Argentine rainforest, rainforests are good, right? Rainforests are carbon traps. So it becomes climate finance. Japan finances a coal plant in Bangladesh, supposedly because it's going to be green coal. In other words, you know, with slightly better technology, less carbon emitting. It finances airport expansion in Egypt. Now we know that airports and air, air travel is one of the major sources of carbon emission. So basically anything that supposedly uses green technology, again, no clear definition of green technology, is used to claim climate finance, even when it is provided as loans, not even as grants. So clearly, what passes for climate finance is a joke at the moment. And so we shouldn't really be even taking those relatively small paltry numbers of climate finance seriously. <clears throat> Meanwhile, let's look at finance going to fossil fuels. Now the IMF made an estimate of the total uh, fossil fuel subsidies, which included both the explicit subsidies, that's the gray columns, and the implicit subsidies, which include a range of things that are not the direct budgetary transfer. And of course, the implicit subsidies are massively larger. So their estimate was that in 2021, it was 5.8 trillion. In 2022, about 6 trillion. And uh, this compare this to you know, less than 100 billion in terms of this ridiculous definition of climate finance. The US alone accounted for about 770 billion per year. So clearly with that kind of government subsidy, the market incentives are all oriented towards fossil fuels still. And that's no surprise therefore that private finance also is dominantly oriented towards fossil fuel in, uh, investment, not towards green investment. Meanwhile, in the developing countries, the ability to cope or even the ability to do minimum mitigation is massively affected by an ongoing debt crisis. More than half of low-income countries are in debt distress or uh, at high risk of it. Uh, Middle-income countries are also involved. There are defaults in many countries like Sri Lanka or severe debt stress in countries like Egypt and Pakistan. There have been 19 debt default events, sorry, 14 debt default events since 2020. And uh, this compares with 19 in the whole two decades before that. Now, it's true that we've had periods like this before of synchronized explosions of debt distress across different uh, low and middle income countries. Typically, these have related to policies, macroeconomic policies in the advanced economy. So it's not just that these are countries that have been so-called badly behaved and so on. It's really because advanced economies have either loosened their uh, macro policies, fiscal and monetary, or tightened them as they have recently, which has led to these periods of debt distress. So this is proof of that, 
So consider the left side. This is the general government gross debt as a share of GDP. And you would think the larger your gross debt, the worse your problem, right? Uh, the advanced economies have very high levels of sovereign debt to GDP ratios. They began in 2018 with 103%. During the pandemic in 2020, it went up to 123%. So a 20 percentage, 23 percentage point increase in the GDP, in the debt to GDP ratio. OK, it came down a bit, but it's still very high, 112 percent. The middle income countries will have been much more restrained. They began with low debt to GDP ratios of 53 percent, went up to 66 percent in 2020, have risen just marginally. Uh, to 68, 69%, which is a very, very moderate rate of debt to GDP ratio, the middle income countries on average. But the low income countries are the real shocker. They had very low debt to GDP, 42% goes up to 48% and stays there throughout the pandemic period. In other words, they are not increasing their public spending. They are not providing the minimum social and economic rights to their people. It's really striking how little their debt GDP has increased. It has been tremendous fiscal restraint, which is really meaning that they are not providing social and economic rights to their people. You would think that that kind of fiscal discipline would be rewarded by the markets. But now look at the right-hand side. This is the spread on the sovereign debt, uh, debt in terms of basis points above the US Fed rate, okay? The advanced economies, you will not, the reason it looks like a flat line is because it is, it has barely increased. It has remained below one basis point. One basis point is one thousandth of a percentage, okay? One, it's below one basis point for the advanced economies on average throughout this period, despite the fact that they increased their public spending, their debt GDP ratios went up, they're still incredibly high compared to all these other countries. Look at the average of the low and middle income countries. Dramatic increase up to an average of more than 700 basis points. And for the, some of the low income debt, debt stressed countries, it's gone up to a eleven hundred basis points and an 11 spread. So majorly, they are facing massive increases in repayment costs even though they have really been fiscally extremely responsible and well-behaved. Now, what does this massive increase in debt servicing mean? First of all, as you can see here, this thing is nearly double of all forms of social protection uh, and social spending. That is health, education, social protection put together for eight countries. That's the low-income countries on the right-hand side of the graph. 171% is spent on debt service compared to all of these forms of social spending put together. For the lower-middle-income countries, it is more than the, uh, the total amount. And for the upper-middle-income countries, it's half of what they spent. Now, obviously, this means that social spending is badly affected, but it also means that public investment, necessary public investment, including for greening the economy, is affected. And also, there is the point that once you have all this high sovereign debt, you have to earn more foreign exchange to service this debt. And so countries that can invest more in brown and fossil fuel investment, they invest in coal, they invest in oil, they invest in any natural gas, anything they can find that, would, that adds to global warming because they have to generate the foreign exchange. Now, the point is that this doesn't just affect the debt stressed countries, it affects many more countries that are servicing external debt at great cost to the domestic population. And, you know, really, it means that even just a minor shock makes it incredibly difficult to finance this debt. So uh, what you could call Ponzi borrowing, that is borrowing to repay debt, is now very common. Now, the trouble is also that, uh, as I mentioned at the start, even the mitigation strategies are uh, pervaded by what is called neocolonialism or what I have also called imperialism. Uh, there are now geopolitical tensions as well, but there is a fundamental approach uh, of the rich countries towards the climate change problem, which is deeply nationalist and operates against the interests of low and middle income countries, and therefore operates against the interests of the globe as a whole, of the planet as a whole. First of all, let's look at cap and trade. It has not been effective in reducing emissions. That's very clear. It's basically an excuse 
for individual companies and countries to actually reduce their own responsibility. Meanwhile, we now have these so-called green uh, measures, the US Inflation Reduction Act, the European Union's um, carbon border adjustment mechanism. These are strongly protectionist. These are oriented towards encouraging green technologies in their own countries, but punishing other countries rather than uh, enabling them to actually get the green technologies and do the green investments themselves. Meanwhile, we have, uh, as I mentioned, the need for new minerals, and these are generating resource grabs with the associated resource curse and environmental problems of mining. There is strong evidence that a lot of the lithium that is being extracted from the lithium triangle in Latin America or, or even in Australia is damaging for the environment in other ways and is leading to displacement of local communities and so on. Recycling waste is another interesting example. So I currently teach in the Northeast of the United States, which is a very progressive part of the country, in a progressive university, in a progressive town. And everybody there has you know, solar panels in their houses and they recycle the waste and it's all very uh, you know, climate conscious. What they don't realize is that most of the waste from rich countries is exporting to the is, is exported to the developed world because the recycling is done in such an inadequate way domestically that it has to be further uh, sorted, and that sorting is done in poor countries, often in very hazardous conditions and with very bad environmental implications. Plastics was stopped; the export of plastics has been reduced because of a global plastics treaty which was pushed by the fact that China refused to import plastics. They stopped the import of plastics for recycling. And that led to global changes and a global treaty that has actually reduced the export of plastics. But a whole range of other hazardous waste is, is exported with all kinds of problematic implications. Private financial markets, as I mentioned, are still incentivized to fund brown investments. There's no regulation, there are no other disincentives. We could, for example, have regulations that say, well, if you're going to invest uh, uh, you know, 1 billion in brown, then you must invest 5 billion in green. But we don't have any such regulations. And instead, the ESG indicators that we have, you know, the environmental, social and governance indicators, now it's well known that these are just greenwashing. There's a lot of exposés done by Tariq Fancy and others which show how most of this is just hogwash, not even greenwash. The new terms, the new things that are talked about a lot are blended finance and de-risking of public-private partnerships to enable more green investments. Unfortunately, a lot of these are just ways by, by which public revenues and therefore taxpayer money is used to subsidize and take on all the risks for private profit without necessarily getting even the kind of green investment that would make a difference. So what do we need? Well, we certainly need changes in the international financial architecture, the economic architecture. At the very start, we have to use market exchange rates, not purchasing power parity exchange rates to determine GDP and climate obligations. We have to bring in historical carbon debt and consider shares of the future carbon budget accordingly. We need massively increased public finance based on global public investment principles. Because, you know, currently it's all seen as foreign aid. It's seen as rich countries being good and being nice to poor countries. Whereas this is a global problem. Climate change is a global public bad. We need global public goods to compensate, and those have to be based on global public investment, which really means every country contributes and it is allocated according to the global need. One possible way of doing this is a new issuance of the IMF's special drawing rights, which are basically liquidity that the IMF can create, to be selectively allocated. I was member of a high-level advisory board of the UN on effective multilateralism. We argued that you should have selective allocation of SDRs uh, based on some triggers, automatic triggers. For example, a climate shock, a terms of trade shock, an interest rate shock, something that is not of your own doing. And therefore you get SDRs that will add to your reserves and enable you to access more foreign exchange. I think the case for proper taxation of multinational profits and the extreme wealth of individuals goes without saying. I mean, the rich that I was talking about, and the 10%, the we have to tax them 
in order to provide the finances that we need for the greening. We have to control private finance and regulate them so that they don't continue to fund brown projects, which the current market incentives all push. I repeat, border ta carbon taxes are not a solution. We should really move away from that. Currently, they are a device for trade protectionism because principles of compensation and sharing of revenues are not clear and just. A global tax and dividend policy, which sounds fine in principle, requires trust and inter international cooperation. Neither of these currently exists. Of course, a critical area is sharing of new green technologies and making them accessible. So basically we have to change the current intellectual property regime and TRIPS has to be renegotiated. Also, I think developing countries must have their own narrative. Currently we respond too much to the narrative that is delivered to us from the centers of global power. So there is a whole red herring debate on degrowth versus green growth. I think that's irrelevant. I think that's a red herring because, you know, the policy proposals of both schools are identical. We should focus on our similarities, not our differences. We need to emphasize adaptation and resilience as important and possibly even more urgent uh, currently. We actually have to forget about constantly waiting for more climate finance from the rich world. We have to reduce foreign exchange dependence and change our fiscal rules so that we generate more tax revenue. We need to move away from an export obsession to focus on sustainable production in agriculture and industry based on local and regional needs and demands and availability. Use all possible methods to actually access new technologies, in, emphasize decentralized and small scale renewable technologies. We have to control the carbon emissions of the very rich through regulation and taxation. Now, it's true that some big countries can do unilateral actions, but combined actions will be much more effective, even with limited issue-based groups. So I believe that developing countries should now cooperate on an issue-based uh, basis, uh, for coordinating tax rules to tax MNCs and extreme wealth, to prevent and move away from resource grabs, which are really on the increase for certain new minerals, and to negotiate sovereign debt restructuring and avoid the austerity-based packages. My colleague at UMass, Nancy Fulbright, has this wonderful saying, necessity is the mother of coalitions. And I think today we really have an urgent necessity to address climate change in an equitable, just, sustainable way. And therefore, we have to get into coalitions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jayati, for your presentation. And it is a comment to thank keynote speakers for their inspiring or uplifting talks. But I think in the case of your presentation, it's um, more apt to thank you for your critical and in-depth analysis, which has clearly pointed out the contradictions and fallacies that we face in tackling the climate crisis and the continuity of fundamental global and social inequalities and of colonial and neo-colonial patterns and that they are central to the problem and that we urgently need to take those issues into consideration if we want to solve it. So before we take questions from the audience, is it now better? Okay, thank you. Um, I will now give the floor um, to comments for De Rod Deivainen, who is Professor of World Politics at the University of Helsinki. And as most of us know, Davos' own work focuses on global political economy and global democracy, as well as the contradictions of global capitalism. So please, Davo, share with us your reflections. This is better. Davo, try this one. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. <clears throat> it's a great honor, Jayati, to be here commenting to you. Wonderful, wonderful, amazing talk. I had the honor to comment to you, maybe, I don't know if you remember, in, we were in Bogota 2015 in a huge Latin American and Caribbean social science conference, and she was there also a keynote speaker, and I had a similar honor there. So uh, unfortunately now from a distance. 
So Ilona already stated the importance of Jayati in this world of science and world more generally. Uh, now listening to Jayati, your uh, wonderful uh, talk, you were I was when you went you were talking about international architecture of different kinds, economic in particular, and you mentioned your one of the academic places where you are. I mean, of course, now you are in India there, but the Amherst, Massachusetts. And I was thinking like, you know, it's a really cool place. And, and thinking about architecture, uh, I was there once in a conference and there was a room, uh, not as old as this one. And normally they have in rooms, in buildings, you can see the name of the architect when you think about architecture, but in Amherst, at least the room of economics department where I was, it had the name of the workers who built it. And I thought that was really good. And that was really like Amherst economics department way of looking at things. And, uh, uh, and I think it was also reflected and it honors this tradition of Amherst and of course traditions from uh, Jawala Nehru University and many other places where Jayati has been, that she dissects and, and, and is able to analyze the global economic architecture in such a uh, complex yet uh, convincing, convincing way. And uh, when I was listening to you now, I was thinking about um, like this approach to things in general and, and global economic architecture in this case that um, we could we could think of as um, what the methods of uh, responsibility attribution are. And that's actually very key. Let's think about many political things through the idea of how to distribute responsibilities. And I think you did it masterfully here in your title, you talk about time of climate crisis. And I don't know if it was intentional, uh, the sort of different double meaning at least there, because we are now in time of climate crisis, but also in order to think about uh, attribution of responsibilities that you masterfully do in your presentation, we have to think of the time scales and we have to historicize and we have to go to the historic construction of responsibilities like, as you say here, no, don't just look at GDP now, don't just look at production or consumption numbers now, even though they are important, but look at the history. And there you were doing it uh, with this, um, showing us, you, you know, charts and historical figures and all that. But, but apart from time of climate change, it was also like the unit of climate change and you have to look at the time scale and also unit, the unit thing. And I think you were doing a great job in, in pointing that, okay, we have this nation state centered idea, uh, sort of tradition of looking at things. So you look at different countries and in Finland, we are very used to <coughs> the situation where people, especially people who are now in many parts governing this country, uh, always say, like, hey, but why should we do anything? Look at China and Finland is, you know, so small and, you know, it's crazy that we sacrifice anything because we don't matter. We are only five million, five and a half million. Uh, someone once cleverly said, hey, now I have, I know how to resolve the global climate crisis. Let's start thinking of the world in units of 5.5 million, you know, any big Chinese city, we just divided it units of 5.5 million. And since 5.5 million units don't matter at all, the net result is that there's no problem with climate crisis because we just think of it through 5.5 million units. And if the argument of the Finnish people who say we are such a small unit, it doesn't matter, we don't have to do anything, we don't have to take responsibility, then that would be a logical consequence. Uh, I'm pointing this out because I think in public discourses for us here as academics and all that is one thing, but especially when we are facing something as important as climate change, stupid arguments out there are something we need to know how to respond to them, even though it may sound like, uh, you know, they may sound like too stupid to really respond to, but we don't really have time to let them, let them um, continue with that. So this unit thing, you point to per capita issues and then masterfully also to that it's not only either 
individuals per capita kind of systems of accounting for responsibility. What is the unit that represents a responsibility? Is it the country? Is it the individual as in per capita? And you also point to, let's say, class differences or differences in high income, low income people within countries. So I think this provides uh, one wonderful uh, uh, dimension of this complex issue of attributing responsibility about um, climate change. And I was particularly impressed as somebody who studied attribution of responsibilities also in like truth commissions and how to deal with past human rights violations and genocides and stuff. You brought the dimension like, did they know? Did they know? We look at the past 30 years, we look at the past 150 years, and this, you know, I'm not, I don't want to throw a Hitler card here or anything, but it's an important debate about attribution of historical responsibility. Did they know when it was happening that it might have these consequences? Did people in Finland know that when we were dealing with Nazi Germany, that certain things were happening in about the Jewish people and other there? Like these are just examples of how important in historical debates of attribute attribution of responsibility, it is to take into account that factor. And I very seldom see that factor taken into account. So I was very, very impressed that you 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 brought that that one <coughs> that one in. And then also what is there that causes uh this uh responsibility and 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 also there you pointed to the uh uh, sort of difference between looking at either a very narrow definition of production or extraction at the point of extraction, and then what some might call a different thing, consumption, or sometimes, you know, people have a broader concept of production that actually includes the point of consumption also. It doesn't, I mean, it's a matter of conceptual clarity, but this also then matters, like when we think about attribution of responsibilities, uh, we're looking at production in a narrow sense of production in a broad sense in, in, in like what are the indicators that produce these ideas, how we attribute um, responsibility. This also reminded me of old debates in drug trade, like is it is it uh, Latin, Latin America, for example, where we met <laughs> nine years ago, uh, Colombia in particular, like is it should the attribution and then mechanisms to do something about it be thought in terms of countries and places where certain substances are produced or how much of the responsibility and thereby also allocation of sort of responsibilities in finding solutions should be placed in places where the consumption takes place. So in uh, I think uh, that, that also brought memories of those debates. So it's very complex. And I think you brought the complexity nicely there, but you sometimes and often combine it with useful for public use and, and for our <coughs> imagination, uh, because it might be like, oh, it's so complex, we can't make any conclusions. Um, now that uh, near where you are now, uh, World Social Forum has just started taking place in Nepal. Um, some of us would really love to be in Kathmandu now. Uh, many people from India are there also. Uh, and, and of course, it, 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 it started as a reaction to World Economic Forum, or a, 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 partially as a reaction to that. So I remember last year, when, during the Davos World Economic Forum, Chayati, I think you had a title, a catchy title in one of your texts where, you know, recognizing the complexity and all that, attribution of responsibilities. So the conclusions can sound like they're very complicated, but your title one year ago was Davos Man Must Pay. Right. So, so it, it may help us think it's, you know, it's very complex. But sometimes it's good to bring, you know, <laughs> concrete, uh, perhaps uh, sometimes a bit simplified, but very useful for our debate conclusions about this complexity. And, and I don't want to take more time here to think about how you go from or reflect on how you go from this attribution of responsibilities to how then allocation of responses that in sort of other Truth Commission or other methods are thought like reparations or, or how, what to do with the 
things we find out once we attribute responsibilities, but I thought you gave wonderful food for thought with all, all these um, ideas about, about different things. Maybe I take something that came from, uh, was it Chomsky and someone, uh, this thing like if, if countries were to attribute 1.5 to 2.5% of their GDP to these things, how much we could do. I bring this up because right now in Finland, Europe, United States, there's this debate about military um, expenditures. And since Donald Trump famously a uh, few days ago brought up this thing uh, that highlighted that in NATO, there is this uh, rule uh, th that he wants to enforce more, that countries should allocate at least 2% to, to military expenditure in order to warrant protection by the fifth article of NATO. And this whole debate, it highlights that the, the military expenditure in many countries like ours is more or less around in the same rank as in, the, in this proposal of uh, between 1.5 and 2.5% that uh, might be uh, used for, for these measures that you you point out. So in order to understand a little bit the magnitude and comparative compare with the uh, military expenditures. Maybe a final question. You started then you uh, the climate imperialism and conceptually you yourself referred to then the term colonialism also. And in the IPCC report of 2022, I think the sixth report, it was the first time IPCC uses at least in its policy brief concept of colonialism, and which was seen as <clears throat> very important, for example, here in Finland, in the debates with and about the Sami question in the North, the concept of green colonialism has been used quite often. And, and maybe I just bring up the maybe minor conceptual question, like to what extent is climate imperialism analytically and politically uh, uh, different or better or worse, or how to compare with then the term colonialism and this imperialism, colonialism, because it's a term that appears more in Finland now, it's more about colonialism, we hear more, so maybe you can give recommendations on that terminological uh, question as well. But overall, I think this was so great, and I was only able to touch a little tiny dimension of your very uh, large, complex presentation that presents not only attribution of responsibilities as an analysis of what has happened and how to think about it historically, how to bring out the factors that are not only the architects, but the people and factors constructing it, but also for the solutions are uh, great. Uh, comments and proposals that I, I'm sure the audience will be very eager to ask more questions about. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tevo. <laughs> Thank you, Tevo. Um, we have gone a little bit over time, so I would suggest that we take 10 extra minutes to take questions from the floor and also from the chat. So if you have a question or a comment, please be brief, um, but we can start collecting a few. So I already saw Barry's hand. Whatever works. 